Blossom a Disaster. I'm your host, Will Carey. I appreciate you tuning in again. And to the people that have continued to follow me since I started putting up this uh, podcast, I really appreciate you sticking with me. Um, as always, you can give a like, review, and subscribe on iTunes. That would uh, help me out a bit. I appreciate you, and I appreciate you being here. Um, before we get to uh, my show, uh, the the interview today, today's a uh, Today's guest is a comedian, Patrick Hasty, one of the hardest working guys I know. I've only known him for a couple of years, but he is one of the most prolific uh, joke writers that I know, and I have a lot in common with him when it comes to music and musical tastes, as well as uh, our uh, origins in rural parts of America. Um, but before we get to the chat today, I want to tell you a bit about uh, where I've been the last uh, week and a half. If you saw a couple uh, on my uh, ep- the episode I posted with John Bellancini, I mentioned that I was going to be doing a show in Tokyo, Japan, and I got to actually do it. Um, my girlfriend and I, um, to celebrate my 30th birthday, uh, went to Tokyo for about a week and a half. And being the uh, what's the what's the word the the forethinker that I I can be sometimes and wanting to add new countries and continents to my comedy resume, I took it upon myself to book myself a show the day we landed. So we literally flew uh, about, I think, 13 and a half hours from New York to Japan, landed, took about an hour train, checked into our hotel after getting lost in the rain, because the way Tokyo is set up, there's a Royal Park Hotel and a Park Hotel on the opposite sides of the uh, street from each other. I can't imagine uh, that hasn't caused confusion before. But we check into our our hotel, and then we immediately go and try to find where the show is. The show takes place, um, and you can check out tokyocomedystore.com if you happen to live in Tokyo and want to see English-language stand-up. The comics who run those shows are a really great bunch, and I had a really good time performing with them. But it was crazy because we eventually did find the show miraculously after navigating the subway and uh and it's at a it took the show took place at a british pub called the hobgoblin and it it felt this it felt similar to other shows that i have done in bars and comedy clubs i feel like it's crazy how comedy the experience of it can trans translate regardless of where you are you're just talking about different things and there are some great comics that i performed with i'll have uh i i'm, I'm gonna try to get them on uh, the show once i figure out how to do skype interviews if anyone hears this and can help me out with the equipment i would need to set up a skype interview i would appreciate it and the show the set was very fun i was looped out of my mind because i've been awake for about like 26 hours and I managed to have a what I thought was a somewhat decent set. There were a couple of cultural things and that I don't think translated, but overall, I, I felt pretty good about it, and I felt like it was a an accomplishment. And it was a, a healthy mix of, of nationalities. There were some locals from Japan, and then there were some expats. Uh, there was a very nice lesbian couple from Scotland who I did some crowd with about my... Uh, some of my bits about going to see soccer internationally. Um, I always love, uh, I always love when I'm able to kind of con- connect with an audience because uh, my style was never conducive to connect to to really interacting with the audience, and it was something I was afraid of for a long time when I started doing comedy. And I'm starting to see, f- discover that I have a little bit of that skill now. It's it's not to uh, to the same degree as like your what I would consider like your truly talented uh, comedians, but it's something that I'm noticing as improving. So all in all, I would say it was a wonderful uh, it was a wonderful time, and it was a pretty good show. So TokyoComedyStore.com if you live in J- in Japan and want to check out English language stand up. Let's go to my conversation now with my good friend Patrick Hasty, everybody. Thank you.
there's a lightning storm happening. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, but it's great. Yeah, no, the H1 is good. This is the the H the H4N. There's an H6 now, Ooh. but this is what we recorded sound on, or what Lisa did for the worst landlord. Oh, okay, yeah, and that uh, and it worked. Yeah, it and sounded it good. Fine. Yeah, uh, when I did uh, Gideon and I did a pod or a web series in 2012, mm-hmm. and we didn't do. Uh, we just use the onboard mic on the camera. Yeah. And so it's one of those things like looking back, there's a lot of problems with it, but like one of the biggest things that we could have definitely fixed at the time is we could have just had better sound, but instead we just didn't know how to do it. And we we're just like, well, fuck it. You know? Yeah. Um, the jokes were good. The scripts were good. Uh, we acted it the best we could. It was just like every once in a while it would sound like we were underwater. Yeah. I was, I've, I've kind of been become mildly obsessed with the production of this movie, Tangerine. Have you read about it at mm, all? Is that the one about the two prostitutes yeah, in LA? Yeah, it's about yeah. the two transgender prostitutes, but it was shot on iPhones. Oh, crazy. And they had like an $8 app and then like a little, like $150 like Steadicam uh, mm-hmm. thing that you can put a smartphone in. And I've been kind of fascinated with how they shot a feature film that, that did great at Sundance. Yeah, what's it look like? Have you seen it? I, I have seen it. It looks pretty pretty good. Yeah. If that's... you really think about it hard, you could probably think, oh, that I could. That's an iPhone. Yeah. But it looks great. Like the colors are really good, and the thing they spent the most money on. The director said this in a few interviews is sound. Like yeah. they had a, a professional sound guy with all the equipment. In that's the room. pretty cool. Yeah. But they were able still able to shoot really quick because they had three uh, iPhones in this rig. Yeah. And they, and they would just do these really quick quick scenes. But that's the big thing he said is that audiences can like accept something looking different, mm-hmm. but if it sounds bad, then yeah, they probably that was, won't bother. That was always the thing I thought of with our web series. Like going into it, I was like, um, as long as the scripts are good, uh, I'll, like if the scripts are good, it looks cool. The sound can be bad, or the sound can be bad, uh, or or the the sound can be great. Uh, the scripts can be great, and the video cannot look good. But I, in my head, I wanted one of those. You had to have two thirds of that, um, right? But that was for my the first thing we did. Now the mm-hmm. next thing I go into, whatever the next like uh, film thing I do is, it needs to all be a hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, across, just because across the board. Yeah, I, I pick apart so much extra stuff in those, um, and also like little things like sticking to scripts and things like that. I'm really, I, I I learned a lot from. It's funny doing a stupid web series in Des Moines, but I learned mm-hmm. so much about it to the point where, uh, I haven't done anything since because I'm I want to make sure I do the next thing right. You know. Yeah. Whatever absolutely. the next. Uh, film project is i i know exactly what you mean like i it took me forever to start doing this because i was like if i don't know what i'm doing and it's not 100 percent perfect i'm i need it to be to be great yeah yeah or at least like amateurish but in a charming way exactly yeah like clerks (laughs) yeah sure that's what the the podcast that i'm doing now uh we do uh uh we just use the h1 you know and Mm -hmm. and we I'm very anal about stuff. And so I wanted to have it in a studio sounding. I wanted it to sound like a studio quality. Um, uh, and then we started it and we're like, well, we're not going to pay for a studio. And so instead we just like we film or we record on the back patio at the Creek in the Cave. Mm-hmm. Or one time we did one in the showroom at Bunga's before a show. Uh-huh. And so like now the sh- we're only a couple episodes in, but this aesthetic of like, yes, you can hear cars go by. Yes, you can hear people talking in the background and stuff like that. That's kind of part of the show now. And so yeah. it, it kind of makes it what I, um, cause I, I, not, I don't like, I don't listen to it, but I listen to it when I edit it. Uh, but it kind of adds like almost like you're sitting around a campfire feel. It really feels like you're just in the middle of a conversation Yeah, uh, that it's I like, like. Yeah. It's like you're immersed kind of in the, in the environment. It mm-hmm. like kind of brings you in a little bit. Yeah. Like, and that's what I, I like about podcasts in New York is that you do have all that stuff. Like you have the sirens. Yeah. 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 I, I love stuff like that. Like, a couple of years ago, I saw... Do you know uh, the comedian Carl LeBove? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Sam Kinison's buddy? Yeah. Weird. I did not think you were going to bring him up. <laughs> no, well, he, he was in New York for a little bit, workshopping a, a one-man show. Uh-huh. And it was great. And he's telling this story about like getting injured on at his like terrible day job mm-hmm. and an ambulance coming and he imitates a yeah, yeah. and then a real ambulance came by like a second later and he was like uh, oh uh, that's great i had to call way far in advance again it was like it's just like one of those beautiful like yeah. live moments oh i love that and that that reminded me of that that's so funny i uh there, I, that's insane about carl above i just last night watched um I am not uh, at all a Sam Kinison fan. I never have mm-hmm. been. I get it. People like, he's like a huge inspiration to a lot of people, but never was for me. 
But sure. uh, on Hulu, Comedy Dynamics, the company, which is great and puts out tons of great stuff. Yes, they, they do. They released a ton of Kennison stuff. And, and one oh, of really? them was his uh, Live in Vegas uh-huh. Which is the special where he comes out with like the two women on the on leashes. Enchan- yeah. yeah, and then he like plays like a Led Zeppelin song on guitar and stuff. Uh-huh. Um, and it is li- like I didn't I knew that was that's towards the end of his career like bef- like when it was really bad like I guess you know mm-hmm. his young comedians is really funny. His young comedians yeah. is very good, and he did um he did a special breaking the rules I think is what it's Maybe. called at the Rainbow Grill or something. Sure, that was uh, is that one good? Pretty. That one's that one's pretty good. The stuff about religion yeah. and about his time being a preacher okay, is that's, good. He still has a lot of that, like kind of what would is now viewed as small minded homophobic yeah, stuff. That's but that's the thing with this live in Vegas is just I bet it's twenty five minutes that. of homophobia, and it's and it's not even I mean you can't even call it homophobia. It's just hate speech, and he's yeah. in like a massive Vegas arena, and like even I mean and they're just eating it up. Yeah, probably. and I know that it was a different time, but like. It wasn't that different, you know? Like, I, I mean, 1989 wasn't that long ago. And the no, room is like, it, it, like, at any point, you, like, you could have just seen people pull out shotguns and go out in the streets and, like, gay bash. Like, I felt like that's uh-huh. what it was building up to. Uh, so I turned it off. Uh, and then I just spent the whole next hour reading about him on Wikipedia and reading all about Carl Lebeau and stuff. Uh-huh. That's crazy. No, yeah. Well, Carl's, like, it's so interesting. For, as big a personality as Sam Kinison was. Mm. Carl Above's pretty mellow understood. He let me play his guitar. Oh, that's cool. He played guitar in the show yeah. and he had this like crazy um I'm I'm gonna get around, but he had a he had a Martin that looked yeah. like it was a Gibson. Okay. And it's like and a like a Les Paul? It was an acoustic guitar. Okay. It 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 was styled to look like a Martin but it, uh, a Gibson guitar, like a J one mm-hmm. two hundred one of those. But it, it was a Martin. Like, I'd never seen anything like it had this a big, thick neck. Because I, I don't know about, about you, because I know you were in, in bands. Yeah, I did too. a lot of band stuff. Um, but uh, my acoustic was, I just did an, I had an Ibanez. Uh-huh. I had a bunch of Ibanez stuff. They were kind of like a sponsor for a while for us. So, really? Uh, not, we had a deal on all Ibanez equipment. And so we took advantage of it. And so mm-hmm. we got, like, my parents held, that's where we got an acoustic. Um, both of my electrics were just GAX 70s, which are just like, cheap like a the hundred and fifty dollar yeah 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 uh with the four the two the two pickups and then i put humbuckers in both of them and then uh um i just had two of those a red and a black um Mm -hmm. so i don't know it's one of those things i don't know shit about guitars but i know which ones i had and i know that i wish i had others (laughs) like i I always wanted to have like that that um trini lopez looking the the kind of like uh it's a gibson and i think it's the one that like uh uh, Dave Grohl plays that big ass red hollow body. Yes, yeah, that's what I've always. I wanted. know exactly the one you're talking about. I can't remember the name of it, but I remember. I remember reading it in a guitar magazine. He was looking for one in Daphne Blue. Yeah. There's like maybe they're really rare, and he tracked one down through someone in the magazine. And oh, cool. Like, he, I think you got to pay a lot of money for oh, those, yeah, yeah, but yeah. he tracked that down. I, I thought like that, that was super cool. So this is this is. I, I like this about you. I, I, this is what I like about you, Pat, because I don't, I can't remember exactly where I met you, but I kind yeah. of feel like we have a lot of the same general interests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're uh, one of those people, yeah, that I feel like with music, uh, surprisingly, Jay Welch is the very similar dude that I feel like it, it really? with music, yeah, it's just like really lines up uh, and with uh, a lot of like the pop culture references and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like that about you because some people in comedy, some people are, are 15 years younger than me and then I feel dumb as hell <laughs> like I just don't know like, what's going on exactly like the or I just run in the circles where everyone's talking about like Drake mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and I I stopped Liz, like I I went through my phases of like rap metal and and rap and listening to more rap but I just don't I just don't really anymore. yeah because I stopped listening around the time all rappers started sounding like they went into the studio after getting shot in the mouth <laughs> the yeah. like all the words got are real, just yeah. followed out of the above I uh I I never got in too big into rap I was in rap metal and I was in a rap metal band and that was a whole different thing that's not that's not being into rap but uh but um which looking at you you don't look no, like someone who was in a I rap do. metal band i do though i'm a white guy from the midwest who grew up in the early 2000s <laughs> like that's 100 percent. we were all in rap metal and you're bands. from and you're from iowa yeah too. Yeah, yeah southwest iowa right outside of omaha nebraska oh okay yeah i grew up my parents house is a farm in a small town but like you can see from our backyard you can see omaha you can see the, the lights and the buildings mm-hmm. 
Um, Cause Omaha is like a college town, right? No, it's not a college town, but it's a, it's a, it's the biggest city in Nebraska, except for on Nebraska corner square football games. Okay. And then it's the second biggest because uh, Memorial stadium is the biggest. The city. biggest That's true. City. Yeah. Uh, it, but, um, but it's got a, it, Omaha has got a great music scene. And when right. I was there was when it was all starting, like in the early 2000s, when I was in a rap metal band, that's when like Bright Eyes and Cursive was still local all the time. Uh-huh. And so we'd do shows at like this place called the Ranch Bowl. And then the next day it would be the faint. And like, no, no one was anybody. It's just like, they got, they hit, they were like, they saw the future and were like, we're going to make good music for the future. And I was like 16, they were like 20 and I was like 16 being like, no, I'm pretty sure Limp Biscuit's the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> Limp Biscuit's going to have a lot of pop culture relevance yeah, for yeah, like yeah. the next, easily the next 15 years. Yeah. The thing I like, the thing that I find bizarrely, I guess there's a bit of schnanfreude about it, but like Limp Biscuit, like where they tour now, they tour like Eastern Europe and yeah. Russia, like the, and the same, the Bloodhound Gang toured the oh, same yeah, places. Yeah, yeah. They, if you stick around, you can stick around, but you just have to play the countries no exactly, one yeah. wants to go to. Yeah, the places that are like twenty years behind us, uh, be, yeah. in, in like pop culture, because they're that's still like revolutionary because they're they're mm-hmm. because of the uh, uh, their history with wars and stuff like that. They're just they're getting to where we were in two thousand now, you know. Right. Uh, yeah, it's like sometimes like if you go like there's places in Russia I haven't been there but I there's places mm-hmm. in Russia that are still like 1990 in America like there's yeah. places over there where that's like that's the the clothing that's the style you know everybody's like Michael Jackson and and like uh, uh, Beastie Boys and stuff like that that's that's the pop culture because that's what speaking to them the way that's what was speaking to us in 1980 it's very right. weird but interesting and good for those people if they want to have a career I guess <laughs> yeah I suppose so it's. I, I guess it's like either that or Vegas at, yeah, at yeah, a yeah. certain point, right? Oh, I mean, I mean, I mean, because like it seems like at a it if you if you're not like touring America, you could just set set up shop in uh in Vegas and do four wall deals. Oh yeah, well, or like you could do like because uh, like I grew up on on all sorts of music, but like I'm also a big fan of country music from especially old timey country music and then nineties pop country music, especially uh-huh. like that's my, like Shania Twain, like Garth Shania Brooks, Twain, Garth Brooks, Tim McGarl. Trish Yearwood. Yeah. That's the stuff that like, I know real well. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't listen to that as much as I listen to like old, like Hank Williams or something like that. But, um, uh, but like there's like Garth Brooks, like he did, he did Vegas for like two years, him and Trish Yearwood, who they're married now, which is insane to me. Like that's like, uh-huh. I, I don't know. That just blows my mind. And, and I watched them on the food network. <laughs> oh, that, oh, that's exciting. <laughs> I didn't even know they were on there. Yeah. Trisha Yearwood has a cooking Does show. Does she really? Yeah. Oh, and, I, and Garth Brooks drops in like he took over an episode and I was just like, Garth Brooks is cooking. Oh man. I love it. He's, uh, I, I, they, they, they did that big, huge, like um, a couple years long stretch in Vegas and yeah. then just built like a solid an act basically yeah where they have stage banter and stuff and now mm-hmm. they tour and they just did like six nights in des moines and like all of my comedy friends went none of them give a shit about garth brooks but it's just like he's now like it's really funny because he's like more than a country musician now it's like an experience it's like yeah but nobody knows that like i, I don't think like if you would have asked any of my friends a month ago garth brooks is coming to town you're gonna go everybody would be like no who gives a shit about garth brooks but then when he was there and people were experiencing it, it's like oh shit yeah let's go to garth brooks right uh and i love that i think that's insane uh uh i have he's one of those people that i like him so much that i will not read any articles about him or mm-hmm. google any interviews because i know there's no way he's gonna I, there's no way he's got the politics i want him to have so i'm just gonna <laughs> it, keep no, my hands out of it, it. Yeah. exactly yeah it's the same thing like it, like you know, like Ted Nugent, this great guitarist, oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. don't listen to anything he has no, to say. Just a, just a, just a garbage. Person. Yeah, exactly. Just insane, like garbage coming out of his yeah, mouth. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so you grew up on, so you're growing up on country, mm-hmm. uh, rap, yeah, rap well, I, and, and, yeah. and heavy metal. Yeah, well, I kind of, um, so I was country. It, there was a very uh, uh, big switch. I remember it perfectly. Mm-hmm. Uh, what age I, was this? Uh, I was country until uh, fourth grade. And then when I went into fourth grade, I decided I was going to start liking rock. And my mm-hmm. older brother was eight years older than me, and he loved, like, metal stuff. But he liked, like, radio metal. So it was more stuff like Godsmack and stuff like that, not like uh-huh. not like hardcore metal, like M- cool metal. Active but, modern rock. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he, and so he was into that stuff. So I kind of decided to split the difference. And so I got really into like Pearl Jam. I just got into nineties rock, like mm-hmm. Pearl Jam, third eye blind, gin blossoms, matchbox 20, all that love stuff. And I still love them. I still think that's all fantastic. Uh-huh. Um, 
And then that was like fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. Once I got into middle school, uh, that was when the me- the rap metal thing blew up and the Ozfest blew up. And that was when I started being in bands. And none of none of my friends, we none of us could sing. Like we had no concept of what singing was, but right. we knew that like, well, Limp Biscuits rapping, we can do that. Mm-hmm. And so we became a rap metal band. Um, and I wrote all the songs, and it was super fun. And we played like shows all around Omaha. We played shows in our hometown, and people loved it and stuff like that. Um, and we were out by the time we were like sixteen. We the band was over. Uh, and by that time, just naturally, I went from being like into like rap metal, which is what we were all into when we were kids, like mm-hmm. when we were eighth, eighth, ninth grade, my friends. Uh, as soon as I got into high school, I started getting into emo and punk, and all that stuff was happening. Um, and so then later in high school, I started a, I was in like a, uh, like a emo rock band that was really fun. And we went on like a, we would go on the road and do actual shows and stuff. And uh, that, yeah, I see. I'm envious of that experience. Yeah. I never got to have that it, the on the road experience. It was great, but it was exactly, um, like I, I, I think the grass is always greener. I uh-huh. wish I would have had the experience of in a van with your friends and you're driving around and you're doing gig, gig, gig. I didn't mm-hmm. have that. I had, we were in a Pontiac Sunfire and we drove two <laughs> cities and we would like, it was just like stand up tours where you're like, cause like, we're, I'm sure you're the same way. We don't tour, but we'll go to like ba- Boston or we'll go to Baltimore for the weekend. And right. then it's like very short stints. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the same thing my band was doing. Uh, but it was amazing and it was super fun. And we got to play these awesome shows, shows that we were so bad. We were not good at all. Uh-huh. Um, our lead singers couldn't sing. Never. We never had a good singer, but, um, uh, we were fun and people liked us and it's a lot like comedy you know how sometimes in comedy there's somebody who's not very funny but like mm-hmm. they're super nice and so everybody's like ah this guy's great that's what our band oh, yeah. was other bands would be like ah it's these guys <laughs> and so They'd that was like, always they're, fun they're, they're nice they're yeah, fun yeah, to be yeah. around yeah and they've got all the instruments so we might as well put them up uh, yeah. yeah so that was that was always fun um, uh, and I love it I still that's how comedy happened was because when I was in a band like for a while my, my emo punk band uh, or I don't well, know it wasn't what, Let's let's trace sure, this sure, a little. Yeah, yeah. Let's trace this a little bit because I'm curious. Because we probably have a, at least we probably could swap some of the more obscure rap metal. Oh yeah, totally. And and and, and maybe less talked about emo and, and sure, punk. Sure. So first first off, tell me what the the name of the rap metal band was and the name of the emo band. Okay, the rap metal band I was in was called Rusty Needle Tattoo Parlor. Uh, Perfect t- name. Yeah, tattoo had one T which was a, just a choice we made once. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, so that was pretty, that was, that was us. Uh, we were more known for our name than we were for as a band. Okay. Um, uh, and that when we were literally like 15, 16, we were just kids. Uh, we put out, tried to put out a record, uh, our lead singer quit, who's still my best friend to this day, but he was just like, mm-hmm. I can't do this. What, what were like the lyrics about? Were you, ang- oh. were you angry yeah, young yeah, men? Yeah, 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 totally. Uh, it was like, angry, um, but not sure exactly what you're mad at. Yeah. And, and also like, um, it was, some of the songs were just like, um, I guess kind of like what I think silver chair was doing what we were doing just good. Like the uh-huh. like some of the lyrics were just like that song Tomorrow by Silverchair. Mm-hmm. It was that. But then we would have like a rapping breakdown in it or something like that where we'd be like faster. But then we had legit like a legit song that was just like all rapping. And it was just like, fuck. The song was called Manic Jester. It was all about like, fuck you. You hurt uh-huh. me, but I'm going to get through this. And you suck and I'm great. And it was just like, but it was like a fun. It, I mean, it was fun for like, I mean, it wasn't, it was angry, but it was like peppy. It wasn't like. It didn't make it sound like we were going to kill you. It made it sound like we were going to have fun. <laughs> okay. I guess kind of. That sounds insane. But mm-hmm. that's we were 15, 16 right in these songs. Yeah. The reason I ask is being from Iowa, and when I think rap metal, I just imagine Slipknot being kind yeah. of a, a, maybe n- not the mountain you want to get to, but sort of like the prototype for what you do. Yeah. And that was happening while I was doing this. Like uh, there was this band. What year was this? This would have been, I was, so it would have been, we started our wrestling little tattoo roller when I was in eighth grade. So 99 into 2000. Okay. So and that's so, around when yeah. Slipknot put Slipknot, their first album out. The, yeah. The first time I saw the Slipknot album was the summer before high school because uh-huh. we went to the mall of America and it was everywhere. And so I bought that album and we were already a band at that point, but we were like still just like playing in like my parents' basement or like in the apartment or something. Right. And then, um, uh, we got that album, loved it. I still to this day think that wait and bleed is like a really good pop song. Like, Oh yeah. It's, it, I mean, it's lyrics are super dark and whatever, but it's like a good song. Uh, and then we found out they're from Iowa and that was that thing. It was like, 
oh, fuck, we can do this. Like, this is real now. Mm -hmm. uh, because before, like, you don't ever think anything's real. But then it kind of hurt us because then it kind of made us think, like, oh, of course, or at least me, oh, of course we're going to make it. Because, like, the, like there were so many things, uh -huh. like, I remember, like, not paying, I didn't do anything in high school. I didn't pay attention to anything. The whole time I was just like, oh, no, I'm going to be, like, a rock star. That's my thing. Mm -hmm. um, no, yeah, I was yeah. kind of the same thing. Like, yeah. I only could pay attention to, like, uh, I could only pay attention to my theater classes, working after school, building sets and rehearsing, mm -hmm. and my guitar class. Yeah. That was all I could put Ooh, any, any effort in other than the minimal. I wish I would have had a guitar class. I still I still know the same 10 chords I learned when I was a kid. It was embarrassing. Uh, I'm so I'm so bad at guitar, but I got so far on it for a while. It was like, mm -hmm. I knew, it was, it's like... Uh, and you're playing in like drop D. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and also like... Uh, I'd be on shows uh, where I would just turn the guitar down and, and like I'd let our lead guy play and I would just turn my guitar down and like look like I was really into it but like there would be no rhythm coming out but like the bass and the, everything else is loud enough that nobody's paying attention because mm -hmm. uh, I'd be embarrassed or something like that. Like I can't, I can't tune by ear. It's like, uh, like you remember when you first started doing comedy and the first time you had to do like a long set, like you have to do 20 minutes but you only have like 10 yeah. Uh, it was that feeling. Like every big show we did, I was just like, ah, uh, this is, I'm going to fake my way through it. But then in between songs, I would riff and like joking and be like silly. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, like, I think it was just every, I, we just got a pass on it. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you were entertaining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were still entertaining, even though we weren't the best. But yeah. that band, the rap metal band, it was great. But like, we didn't have like, uh, uh, we, uh, I had more of a real band experience with the emo band. Um, mm -hmm. a couple years later. Uh, but I still loved, uh, the whole time. And there's some of that music, like I'll still like put the, hide the Spotify, like put the, uh -huh. you know, so it's not shared on Facebook. And right. Put, listen put, to, like, yeah. Just go into your Pete booth. Yeah. And I'll listen to like, especially like that first Limp Bizkit album. It's like, it's so nostalgic. $3. $3 yeah. Bill. It's so nostalgic for me that I enjoy listening to it, even though I know it's bad. Same thing with the Linkin Park album, the hybrid theory album. Oh yeah. I know it's bad, but I can still like get into it. I, I still like those first two Linkin yeah. Park albums. I sort of lost interest after uh, the third, the third you know, one. Because they started to... Linkin Park were interesting because they seemed... They always had those sort of the rap mm -hmm. uh, elements to them. But whatever was big in pop music sort of bled into their sound as well. Yeah. Like around the time that like Def Cab started getting big is around that so time that song, What I Done. Oh, yeah, 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 out, totally. Which I thought sort of was like, oh, it's like if Linkin Park were like an in, like an indie band. Yeah, and uh, 100% when uh, Midnight, that album, it was like Minutes to Midnight or something came out. Yeah, that's It what, was like a U2 album. Like there were songs on there that sounded like U2. Yeah. Well, Shadow time. of the Day, I'm pretty... Is that the it, one? Shadow of the Day, that... And, <laughs> yeah. It has that sort of like chugging bass riff. Yes, yes, yes. Riff. And the, I heard that and was like, oh, that's like With Her Without You. Mm -hmm. It's not the exact same notes, but it's the same style. That's, yeah, and I'm that's not trying song. to... I'm not trying to talk shit because I definitely would like, oh, I like this song. I'm going to write a song like this. Totally, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I would think, like, I have like... like I, I wanted to be Blink One Eighty Two sure, so yeah. bad. That was yeah, like that was like my 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 artistic like high point that mm -hmm. I wanted to hit like that like I wanted to play those like really fast muted uh, eighth notes and just go pop 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 yeah, pop, yeah. pop on single notes. I'm what I'm curious about rap metal with you specifically is what are some of what are some of the bands that you go are there bands that you go back and go like. God, how did they even get a record deal? Oh yeah, well, and it's and when I and I use rap metal as a catch-all, even though some of these bands aren't rap really, but like, um, uh, like there's a lot of bands from that time. Like there's certain ones, like Seven Dust has a lot of really good music to them. Yes, like they're they really good uh, uh, musicians, and like Lejean wrote really interesting music and stuff. So mm -hmm. I got that. But then there was bands like Cold Chamber. Like I don't know if you ever heard them, but they were so bad and it was almost the, their song yeah their song fiend that was yeah. uh, dark from dark days yeah and well and and uh, loco they had this song called loco that was on their first album uh -huh. um that was so bad and it was like cartoonishly bad and like, i when i was uh -huh. into it i was like this isn't good i loved them but i was like this isn't good music um uh there were so many bands like that and and then like i have a, a good obscure one for you Dar that? darwin's waiting room Ooh, I don't know. They put out one album. I'll play it to. I'll, I'll play for you after. Called a. They put out one album, as far as I know. Maybe a second one, but it was like, 
it was like corn meets Lincoln Park. Oh wow, that's yeah. I don't need that in my life. <laughs> yeah, and they were on they were on Univer they were on Universal. Yeah, were they on like an imprint like M- Elementary or something? Or no, Universal didn't know. No, I I think they it were just- on. They had like one. It was like, and I would put them in the categories of like bands like Scrape. Okay. Or yeah. um, I think Scrape had a good Edema. S- uh, yeah. Okay. Edema, and then like um. Primer uh, 55 was another one. All those one. bands, yeah, yeah, yeah. Primer 55. Soil, Drowning yeah. Pool. Oh, see, that's like the era of music where I'm like, that that was when I was getting out of it. That was when uh-huh. I started transitioning into like uh, the emo world and stuff. And what but, were and what were some of the bands that fueled that transition? The, and I also want to ask oh, yeah. you this too, because I think my rap metal phases uh, coincided when I was at my m- most angry as a teenager. Sure. Um, and then as I got older and my my anger translates into depression. <laughs> like yeah. it, it usually is because depression, I think is sometimes anger just yeah, faced yeah, yeah, inward. Yeah. I've heard, uh, I think I heard that on a, a podcast. <laughs> Probably well, this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's when I started moving into like more pop punk. And yeah. Like your, your slower stuff, like, you know, the new Amsterdam yeah. and, um, like a get up kids. What like what that. happened to me? So I said how my brother was older than me is he went to, he was in the army. So when I was in starting middle school, my brother was in the army. Yeah. And I want to know about like your family too. So. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Sorry. No, to no, that's fine. So you have how many brothers? I have sisters? a brother and a sister. They're both older than me. Brother. and a, Okay. So yeah. you're the, young, you're the youngest. Mm-hmm. What's your, uh, what do your parents do? Uh, my parents, my dad, when I was a kid, my dad, my dad worked at a slaughterhouse. Uh-huh. And my mom works, um, she takes, well, she's retired. Very Midwest. Yeah, yeah. She, my mom took care of uh, mentally challenged people. Uh, uh-huh. In my hometown, there's a place uh, where um, it's it's like a campus where there's like 300 people or maybe more or less. But um, if you have if you have Down syndrome or some sort of uh, something like that, you go there and you live there. And then they're like my parents, everybody in our hometown, if you don't go to college, you go there and work. Um, and it's right. great. It's a cool, it's a state job. Um, these people get to have awesome lives. Um, my, everybody in my family get to have awesome jobs. Um, and so that's where my mom worked. And then when I was in high school, my dad stopped working at the uh, slaughterhouse and started working there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, because of that, it, it was state jobs, so it was pretty good benefits. We were super poor when I was a kid, but then as uh, the 90s got better, uh, we got a little more money. Also, my brother and sister getting out of the house helped. Mm-hmm. So then it started getting nicer and nicer. So by the time I was in high school, I, we had like a little better situation around the house. So like that's how I got to like get good instruments and stuff like that. Gotcha. And, yeah. Um, but so the music thing, there was this band. Did you ever hear of a band called Ultra Spank? Uh, uh, that name sounds familiar. I don't think I they, listened to They them were that. good. I still like them. Um, and my brother, so when he went to the army, he would tell me he was on, he was in, on the, the, West, uh, the East Coast. And he would find out about bands before I before they would get to the Midwest. Mm-hmm. So like he told me about like Godsmack and uh, Seven Dust and all those bands a year before they broke. So yeah. he'd tell me, and then I'd tell all my friends. And it was kind of you were saying about how you were going through your dark depressive thing. My yeah. brother was going through that, and so my brother while he was in the army. Yeah, and so my brother was getting into that music, and he was telling me, and I was just like, well, I want to like whatever the coolest music right now is. So I was kind of like, okay, I was like an angsty teenager, but I wasn't that sure. bad. But so then I got into all that stuff. Um, and Ultra Spank, um, I believe it was like the brother of one of the band members was my, my brother was really good friends in the army with the brother of one of the band members of Ultra Spank. Uh-huh. So they would go to like Static X shows, uh, OzFest shows and stuff like that and get like backstage stuff and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and so because of that, I found out about all these bands so early. And like, I mean, like uh, I keep going. Oh, I had a Fear Factory shirt like before, like anyone in the Midwest knew who Fear uh, Factory Fear was, Factory, and like, yeah. um, and I was really into it. But then by the time I got like, I got when I got like uh, in my dark, depressed years, it, uh, it wasn't that. It was like, uh, it was when I got into like uh, uh, Dashboard Confessional and stuff like that. Me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dashboard, yeah. the first like Screaming Infidelity is the yeah. first time oh, you totally. hear it, and No Girls Like You. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, that's I. That's the stairway to heaven for sad kids in <laughs> suburbia i uh i the early aunts my band uh the emo band i was in we played with a ton of christian bands and it's uh mm-hmm. we were kind of we were a christian band even though I, uh, most of us weren't christians now i i wanted to ask you about yep. that too um what do for you what defines a christian band uh we were okay a real christian band is for me at that time was a band on tooth and nail records or on solid state 
who um, in the liner notes talked about God. Uh, they after shows they would uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, witness or whatever. You know, yeah, they would really sit and talk about God. Yeah, this was legit Christian rock. Um, okay, how about Goatee Records? They I don't had, know that. They had that's like where Reliant K was. Okay, yeah, Reliant K was a Christian band, but then they yeah. started phasing out of it later on. Yeah, they they started. MXPX of did. did the same thing. Um, Blindside did the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there were some bands who just stayed in and and uh, 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 what's that band? Uh, yeah, well, Switchfoot. Like, uh, yeah, they Switch never foot. they never dropped the Christianity part. Juliana Theory totally dropped it, and I saw them. On yeah, the, I had no idea they uh, Juliana Theory were considered a Christian uh, band. I, I thought they them, were just an emo band. I saw them on the tour where they dropped it, and so I was at a show. Uh, the whole place was packed with like youth group kids, like fourteen mm-hmm. to sixteen. And this was the tour that they decided that they were not going to be a Christian band anymore. And the lead singer dude was just like, fuck this, fuck that. Uh, oh, look at that bitch over there. I'd fuck her after the show. And then they were playing their same songs. And like at one point, all the kids turned their back on him and stuff. It was in, It was like, I totally get it. Because he was probably like 25 and was like, I have this whole career. I don't really believe in this stuff anymore. I got to get out of this. What do I do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cauterize the wound. Uh, but it was just no, like ex- too much. Uh, that was crazy. Yeah, yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. It's like it's like when Rocky gets like his eyes swollen shut, so he just has to yeah, cut totally, me. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and 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 fortunately, it didn't work out for them, you know. But other bands got through it, like uh, Pedro the Lion. That guy Bison, I don't remember his name, but mm-hmm. he figured out a good way to transition out of it. Um, Sufjan Stevens kind of did that too. Like he was yeah. never. I don't think he was ever officially Christian, but like right. he figured well, out a way. Ju- yeah, it just seems like well. Reliant K for me are like the it just their first album like it's all God mm-hmm. and, and, and Jesus in the lyrics, and then eventually it just you start phasing you start like saying Jesus and God in the lyrics less yeah and that's not really and that's a, I think a less ex, that's probably a less extreme way of distancing yourself from Christian rock as a marketing Mm -hmm. angle. Yeah, totally. Because a lot of it, I think, is a marketing decision. Like, you have this built-in audience and whose parents are going to be like, oh, you can listen to that. That's that's okay. And... and, But, yeah, I can eventually see, like, not wanting to be pigeonholed by that. But Switch... It's interesting you bring up Switchfoot because Switchfoot, I think, transcend that just because they're good live. Yeah. I I saw them... They opened for... uh, uh, Chelsea and I went and saw them with a band called need to breathe mm. they're sort of like a uh, uh where well how would i describe need to breathe basically like um I, you could put them next to like sister hazel they're okay. a little maybe a little more of a country sister in hazel sure. um sister hazel also very good life yeah. um but switchfoot were were great live yeah uh i saw them at turn they we saw them at terminal five and the lead singer like climbed the speaker stacks oh, and cool. like i don't know if you've ever been to uh-uh. terminal five it, it there's like three tiers it's sort of like the the music video for acdc's uh thunderstruck okay and he climbed the speaker stacks climbed over the the barricade uh on top of some people knocked all their drinks over oh geez and then started just singing walking through the venue oh that's pretty cool before eventually getting back up to the stage so I, I I never put them in that category of Christ, Christian yeah. rock, really. But they kind of transcend. I was like, yeah. oh, this this guy's this guy's legit. Uh, I was real. No, I was in that band, uh, Summer Too Late. Uh, we were really like, I was seventeen, sixteen, seventeen, and mm-hmm. I look back like oh, we always try. I always try to downplay that we were in a Christian band, but I like literally. What was we, your your band called? Summer Too Late. Summer Too Late. And it was, okay. and even the name people took as. So, oh, summer too late to heaven. And we're like, okay. And we sold a shirt that had a cross on it for a little bit. And we're like, mm-hmm. shit. Um, but uh, we got to open for so many amazing bands. And like Ace Troubleshooter, who was this awesome band. Further Seems Forever, we were supposed to open for them. Uh, and I then he quit. Them. Yeah, the dude. Which lead singer? Cariba, or Chris Cariba. Oh, this was when Chris Cariba was doing. He quit to go to do Dashboard full time so we couldn't open for him. Uh, uh, like it was crazy. Uh, we could get, ugh. we could, he's back with them now. I saw that. Yeah. We could, they do we like, could make that happen. Do they do a tour or do they just do like one-offs? Cause I, I knew a, like I last know. year. Uh, well, because he's doing, he's doing twin forks also, which is I th- his sort of a uh, more folk influenced. Oh, I've never even listened to that. It's good. That's what the, uh, the guy from, um, I, liked it. I, I really liked Juliana theory, even after they, he, he broke and went crazy and stuff and they stopped huh. being Christian. 
uh, which I guess is the opposite of going crazy. But uh, I, I, re- I still got into them. But then I, I, it was one of those things like a year ago. I was like, oh, I wonder what he's up to. And I looked and he put out like a, like a folk album. But I was like, I was like, this sounds so for. It sounded like, uh, like an A and R guy was like, uh, Mumford and Sons is big right now. Why don't you do that? And he just did his version of it. It was just so. I, I was so not. It was so not good. I was like, he's such a good writer, and in right. that certain way that I'm like, I don't want to hear. Yeah, you can kind of tell though. he's not yeah. really into it. it well, did you ever play the emo game? The, the it was a computer game. Um, I probably did. There, it was it was this really funny. Uh, the game was that. Um, uh, you it was like an eight bit game, uh, a flash game, mm-hmm. and uh, you had to you would you would work with other emo bands constantly, and you were trying to kid. I think it was the band Kiss had kidnapped somebody and you had to go like get him back uh but there was this one of the levels was uh you uh you do you you were with juliana theory and you had to walk him through this mall while mm-hmm. you were getting attacked by um uh chubby girls in weezer shirts like that was who was attacking you uh-huh. and the whole time the lead singer of juliana theory kept gets kept getting killed because he would keep pulling out a mirror and looking at his face and the whole idea was that he was so vain right. uh but it was a great game and it had awesome stuff in it uh but that was that was the whole aesthetic was that he was such a a jerk, and mm-hmm. so the fact that he's now doing a folk band, I'm like, of course he is, like, because he wants to be, you know, Mumford and Sons or the Lumineers or something, and he's just yeah. trying to capitalize. But he had like a thing, like they were some of those songs are real good. Yeah, um, just a bummer. Um, yeah, I feel this. LA, it's always a bummer when like it's, you kind of have to want to distance yourself from the art and the person making at some point. Like I've I've heard like rumblings that Isaac Brock from Modest Mouse is yeah. kind of kind of not the nicest dude that, to, yeah. to hang around with. But I just want to keep blasting float on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, comedian uh, Tom Brady, he's got a yeah. really great joke right now about uh, how he loves Third Eye Blind, and as do I. And he's like... Oh, I saw him live oh, in college. It I've, was really oh, fun. Oh, yeah. I saw him live a few years ago, and they're, I love them. I love their music. Uh, and he's got a great joke uh, uh, basically about how like... Uh, uh, it sucks when your favorite band is still going because mm-hmm. like like if your favorite band is like Jimi Hendrix he's dead he can't say stuff to fuck you up but like he somebody asked Stephen Jenkins uh, what the song Deep Inside of You is about and he like recently and he just said pussy and he's like no don't do that don't be gross it's like it hurts you as a fan of the band when you're like no why couldn't you have stopped 10 years ago yeah oh that's a great joke uh, that's, a, uh, that's hysterical so yeah like or like the police song, Every Breath You Take. Yeah. Like, you, I remember hearing it. And then once I learned it was about stalking somebody. Yeah, yeah. It's creepy. Yeah. Music is creepy as shit sometimes. Yeah. There was a song. I, I can't. I'm going to totally butcher the, like, just underage sex in pop songs yeah, is yeah, just yeah. a really popular thing to sing about in, like, the 60s and 70s. And not even that. The 80s. That She's it, only 17 song. Oh, it's like, daddy Jesus. says she's too young, but she's old enough for me. Yeah, it's like, come on. Yeah, or like a Stray Cat, Sex Scene 17, mm-hmm. or this, the song I'm talking about, like the song, like the lyrics are straight up, uh, you say you're too too young, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, it's, it's like uh, people didn't take shit serious. <laughs> like, I don't know, we've we've really evolved as a, as a society and stuff like that, and I think it's funny that like, I get like evolving on like things like homophobia and mm-hmm. like racism and stuff like that. That seems more natural. But the fact yeah. that we also evolved on not fucking kids, like I was like, wow, yeah. that I feel like that we should have got inherently. Like you know what? Right. You that know? should have just gone without saying. Yeah. Yeah. Very weird. Yeah. Should, uh, uh, okay. Someone needs to write the song. Uh, someone needs to write the song called uh, "Age Appropriate." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. or something like she's that. She's only seventeen, so uh, I. She's just my friend. My 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 daughter's friend. I don't know. I don't. She's just my daughter's friend. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stay in the kitchen yeah. and make pancakes for everybody. Yeah, I'm 32 and wear a wig, so I'm just going to <laughs> date other women that are 32 and wear wigs. Uh, exactly. Oh, uh, that's great. So okay, so you're playing in bands, and it sounds like you were having a a like some local success in your yeah, but, in your area. But kind, I think. Not really. I think we were, but the Omaha, knowing now on retrospect what was happening in Omaha, like, no, not at all. Like, when Saddle Creek Records was going, that was when that was starting. Mm -hmm. And, like, at the time, I'd been like, yeah, we're killing it. We're doing shows every weekend, blah, blah, blah. But, like, oh, no, there was a whole revolution of music happening in the same venues, and we had no idea. So it's like, oh, no, we were nothing compared to that stuff. Uh, Mm -hmm. But uh, but it was fun, and it felt successful. And it got me to the point where I, I realized too early 
that I'm not cut out for real life. Like I can't, uh, like I, I was, I'm like, I can't work in a bank forever. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of hit this. I, I hit the same wall. Like I was playing when I was playing in bands and, and like doing plays and just, that was the first thing I gave a shit about. Yeah. And I worked and I was working hard and enjoying it and really excited to do it up until that point. Like I'd kind of, I'd burned out on play. Didn't want to play baseball. Didn't want to play soccer anymore. Uh, that came back later. Yeah. Um, didn't, uh, didn't want to do like team, team sports. And this was like the first thing I, I was like excited to do. And I was like, how am I supposed to like, how am I supposed to go study marketing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and I tried and too. get a job after this. Uh, I'm just going to be to be miserable. Even 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 now, like I've I have a job now that sucks the le- the least, um, but still, like yeah. I'm I come alive as a human when I'm doing art, yeah, or music, yeah. or or comedy. That's a, that's the biggest thing. The last band I was in uh, in college, my freshman year of college, is when we broke up. Uh, we were basically like just we were what I kind of think I always should have been in. We were like a wannabe '90s rock band in 2004. Like mm-hmm. we were, we sounded like bare naked ladies. Um, and uh, I liked writing those songs. I hated the lead singer, so that's why we never really worked. Mm-hmm. We and we only did like three shows, but it was like the most rewarding band I was in. Yeah. Um, and then that ended in '04, and I started comedy in 2011. And from those years, the rest from '04 to 2011 was just like this weird. Uh, like, like people, sometimes people are like, oh, you do so much stuff. Like I run shows and I, and I like have podcasts and stuff, but it's, I do, I do, I do admire your work yeah. ethic and the it's, amount of stuff you put out. It's just cause I'm manic and because I, I literally feel like, uh, I wasted so much time. I wasted so much time. Not, not Kevin. You, you have uh, like PTSD from kind of, yeah. Like you're trying to make up for those six years. Okay. Yeah. So what, so, okay, so 2004, the last mm-hmm. band you're in ends, you're still living in Iowa? Yep, I'm in college at this point. You're in college, uh, what are you studying? Uh, I was doing marketing management, um, mm-hmm. which I was kind of good at, and then I transferred to history, okay. uh, which I was even better at. Uh, I, I, I'm good at marketing, and I'm good at business, but I, didn't, I don't, I have, I, I loathe it, and I don't have a, any interest in it, so I switched to history thinking maybe I could be a teacher someday. Okay. No. And... Where's the? Did you hit a point where you're like, oh, this is not gonna? Uh, I can't I, live that the life I'm planning. Well, I started dating my wife when we were just dating in college, and okay. she's a landscape architect, and she knew oh. from when she was like 18. That's what she wanted to do. So she went to college. We met at, at college. Uh, she was great at it. She got her degree. Uh, we got married. We moved to we moved from Ames, which is where Iowa State University is, go Cyclones. Mm-hmm. Uh, we moved to Des Moines, which is about an hour south. Uh-huh. Um, and I I grew up in Omaha, which is a bigger Midwest you know Midwest city. I moved to Des Moines where I didn't know anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and our plan always was. And you're, mar- you're you moved to Des Moines. You're married. Just got married, and the plan was, uh, since I had dropped, I had stopped going to school. Uh, I had like a year left, but I stopped so that we could save money for the wedding and everything. Uh-huh. She graduates. We're in Des Moines. And uh, by this time, it's 2011. I mean, I was I was running gas. I was working at gas stations. I was going. My wife was going to school. Uh, we traveled a lot, uh, which was awesome. Got, like we uh-huh. went to Europe and stuff like that a bunch of times, and Ireland and France and stuff. And so that was cool. But like, um, <laughs> this, this kind of parallels the beginning of my relationship yeah, with yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The, with Chelsea because yeah, I was working shitty calls. I was working at a terrible call center job before then. I was before and before that. I was piecing together like temp jobs at like b- bookstores and like yeah. ushering at Radio City and was working at Starbucks. Gosh, so okay, so you're just so you, you you're in Des Moines. You're doing you're working at at gas station. Yeah. Even saying that is insane. What I because like I just realized, oh four. So that oh four is when I stopped being doing music and I was just in college. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing that I can even think of that seems relevant really is two thousand ten, like when I got married. So it's like. Mm-hmm. Between 04 and 2010, it was literally just being drunk. Uh, I'm I, falling in love. Traveling the world was super fun. Uh, uh-huh. Hanging out with my friends. But dropping out of college and running gas. I worked at gas stations. I ran a come and go gas station in a mm-hmm. small town, which was an experience, but not what I wanted my life to be. Yeah. Um, and you just kind of have that anxiety of like, oh, I kind of, yeah. I can't get trapped And I was just here. waiting for my wife to graduate college. And then it was supposed to be my turn. As soon as she graduated college, I was supposed to go back to school, get my teaching degree, maybe go be a teacher, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the plan. That was the plan. And then we, we moved to Des Moines. She got a job there. And we started doing, um, uh, I started actually doing 
it was time for me to start going to school. Mm-hmm. And uh, literally, I, I was walking to this like little this place called the Des Moines Social Club. It was this mm-hmm. little place in an old or in a, uh, like an old strip mall type thing. And uh, I saw a sign that said "Comedy Open Mic." And I was like, "Well, shit, I, that'd be crazy. What if I did that?" And uh, did I, you like stand up before this? Oh, I love stand up all my life. I've been addicted to it. Um, and I and I even when I was like. 18, 17, 18, I even like thought about it. Like I, I wrote like some jokes that I still remember. Uh-huh. Um, I was like class clown, uh, seventh and eighth grade and stuff like that. Uh, always the funny guy, but I never, yeah. I, I always was music. Even in that period, like in, I was, I wrote, I have two albums worth of songs written that I've just never done anything with mm-hmm. that I wrote in that 2006 to 2010 period. Um, because I was always still thinking music was the thing. Yeah. Um, and then I saw this thing for comedy and it literally clicked. I was like, oh, I guess I could probably do comedy too. Um, I could try it. Mm-hmm. And so I did it. I started going to these mics in Des Moines, meeting comics. And like after a couple of months, I went to Stacy and I was just like, hey, what if instead of going back to school in January, what if I just try comedy for a year and see what that's like? And she was like, so she's super supportive. Um, the, the, I, yeah. was, I was going to I was going to yeah. ask you that because um, when I was talking to John Balancini mm-hmm. and he's married to a lawyer, he's a, a lawyer, and then he they're already married, and then comedy comes in later, and this is something I never even thought of until yeah. Ch- Chelsea brings up. It's like oh, and then like how did that affect uh, Amy? Mm-hmm. Um, so I was that's well, I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, number one but that is something i wonder about is is comedy like a pitch to to your wife well um at first totally and she didn't know what i had done this thing beforehand so um i started comedy in april uh uh april 2011 i had also another thing i'd been doing that whole seven years or whatever not seven whatever between 2004 and 2010 uh was i was writing screenplays all the time but never doing anything with them not showing them to anybody just writing them on my computer and Mm -hmm. so my wife knew that she knew that i had these these drive and stuff yeah. But she didn't know what to do. And she's, like I said, she knew from when she was 18 what she wanted to do with her life. And now she's still doing it. And she's very successful at it. And she loves it every day. Um, I didn't have anything like that. And so uh, early 2011, I had a friend that was still going to college. We got a bunch of equipment from Iowa State. And we attempted to shoot a short film that I'd written. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we tore our apartment out, took two days, really worked our asses off on it. Uh, and just it. It, it, it was a clunker. It sucked. I ended up taking uh-huh. the footage and making a music video for a friend of mine because, like, it was just, like, it didn't work. Right. Um, and then right after that's when I saw the thing, and I started comedy in April. And uh, my wife said, like, right away, like, after, like, six months, she was like, this is your thing. Like, it was you, my whole uh, personality changed because it was the first time I had that thing that my wife has with landscape architecture or mm-hmm. the thing that, like, my best friend Joey has with being, he's a chef. That thing that they had, I never had that. And all of a a sudden, yeah. And all of a sudden, with comedy, I had it, and she saw that. And so she, I, I don't. She's not. She's always nothing but supportive most of the time, even like financially supportive because it's not a money maker. Yeah. Uh, And I think I'm very lucky in that. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I did spring it on her, you know. Yeah, that's what that's what I'm I'm finding the, the exactly the understanding of the need to have uh, to have something mm-hmm. um is is crucial for i think for it to even have a possibility of working yeah because my biggest fear and that's a big part of why i think i was single for seven years was um that i was afraid that i was going to meet someone really fall for him and they were eventually going to make me choose yeah and I've i've had friends that have done that I never made that decision, uh, and it. I'm. I, it's terrifying. You know? Yeah. Um, I, that, yeah. Yeah. That was my biggest thing is is living in fear of that. Luckily, I. I yeah, don't, you got around. Don't have yeah, that, yeah. but. That's the one thing I love about. Um, also, because being a landscape architect, that's a. It's a. It's a career. It's a very professional career, but mm-hmm. it's also extremely artsy. Like she took a ton of artsy stuff, and she's a very artistic person. So like. I moved to New York when I was two years into comedy. And in mm-hmm. Iowa, two years in is like, I was doing a lot of cool stuff already. Right. Um, like, stuff that I wasn't ready for. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you, know? you were like maybe doing like the I was big local shows or doing like 20 minutes on the road. You're doing long sets, 30 minute sets and mm-hmm. stuff. So you're featuring it like the funny bone. No, there was none of that. Uh, okay. I, it was all like bar shows and one nighters, but I was doing long sets and I was right. getting known as like one of the bigger comics in Iowa. 
But mm-hmm. I was so smart because of this comedy boom we we're in. I was smart enough to know, like, oh, I'm not good. I would listen to my material and be like, that's not that good. Um, and so I moved to New York because I was like, that's where you get good. And my wife luckily could move here. But she didn't move right away. She had to stay I remember in Iowa. that. Yeah. Um, and so I was, my first year in New York was really bad. And I, I didn't make any friends. And I was really in my head all the whole time. And uh, we were just talking one time. And I was, so I was like at this point, like three and a half years in maybe. And we were talking. And she's like, you're like a junior. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, it's just like when I was a junior in college. She was like, I was panicking all the time and I didn't know shit. She's like, that's where you're at right now. You're a junior in stand-up comedy. Like, you'll just keep Mm -hmm. going and eventually you'll have your master's in stand-up comedy, but that's not going to be for five, six more years. And it was like, the way she thought about it so uh, uh, educationally and and like realistically that I was like, oh, that's amazing. And so, so many things like that ever since then, I'm like, um, like if if I have a really great set, I'm like, well, shit, I'm five years in and I just did that good. That's awesome. But if I bomb, right. I'm like, well, I'm five, uh, I'm five years in. That person's that's... nine years. And of course they're way better than I am, you know? Yeah. Um, and being pragmatic like that and realistic, I think uh, it helps a lot of the anxiety that comes along with it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like I, once I, once I put the ability to p- kind of put stuff into perspe- perspective and ultimately think about for me it was thinking about what i can control Mm -hmm. because i can't control if jfl is gonna yeah yeah yeah. i can't control if come what if i'm getting tv but what i can control is i can control having a show somewhere i can control having a podcast that i put out every Mm -hmm. every week i can control i can control like that these are all like things that i can manage and it's even if it's not me quitting my day job I am at least doing something. Yeah. I just need to be doing something. And that's, I bet you that a lot of that is because you were in bands and you have that little DIY, um, yeah. you know, and when did, how, I guess maybe not, cause you were, I just started li- th- thinking about all the, the, yeah, DIY, yeah. punk rock, do it yourself. Yeah. What were you going to say? I was going to say, how old were you when you started comedy? Um, it was 2007. So I think I was 21. Okay. So you're, that's, a, that goes against what I was thinking, but. Um, it, was, it was a little bit later you, than, than most people. You are doing a lot of stuff. No, not later at all. That's right on. Because like I started when I was 20, 26. So like uh, I feel like a dinosaur right now. There's mm-hmm. comics like right now, like Nikki Glazer, who I love, and she's like a huge inspiration to me. Oh, yeah. She's, she's like great. months older than me. You know what I mean? Like we're mm-hmm. so close in age. Um, and it's one of those things like uh, that's part of that wasting time thing. Like that's mm-hmm. why I'm doing stuff. It's like uh, I don't think um, – I'm very realistic, and I don't think that um, I'm not gonna say no to anything ever. But like, I'm not a, I'm not hoping and praying that I get Montreal or that I get like TV. Like, I'm not. That's not what I'm hinging everything on. Mm-hmm. I'm hinging on everything that I just like you said that I can create, and then if I get something because of it, that's awesome. Um, like, I've always kind of felt like because uh, uh, I've always kind of figured that like once I if I get into like the cool clubs in New York. It's not big, gonna be because like I barked and then hung out and all that kind of stuff. It's gonna be because I accidentally fell into something else and now all of a sudden people like me and they're gonna be like, oh yeah, you can come do this thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, um, it's just that's kind of how I've always, uh, that's how I've been doing this stuff. And it's been, it's kind of stupid, but it's been like successful for me. Like I feel good about where I'm, what I'm doing um, and where I'm at. And that's the thing that like I never expected when I was here for the first six months to a year when I was like, I felt like I was drowning. It, to think yeah, that, like, no. I could be at a point where, like, I'm running a show that I'm really proud of and that people like, and that I'm running, like, an open mic that I'm proud of and that people like and stuff. Like, um, uh, I never expected that. And so when it's happening, that feeds everything else. Because, you know, like, if you're happy, if you're feeling uh, 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 creatively fulfilled, your writing's going to be better. And so it's, like, all this yeah. shit happens. Um, and, uh, and now I'm just waiting for it to all crash. Like I'm waiting for all the, the bottom to drop out and then I'm back oh, oh, to being screwed. Oh yeah, exactly. Like our, I think for, it seems like everyone who's has any sort of success in stand up, like their lives fall apart yeah. more, multiple times. Yeah. There's a quote that, uh, I'm really big on like, uh, I love reading comedy advice and when, whenever anybody I like writes something, I always read it. Um, mm-hmm. and I read a quote that Marion said or something about like how, uh, uh, I don't trust anyone who hasn't, uh, who hasn't let their life fall apart once or twice, uh-huh. something along those lines. And I love that. Cause like, there's been times, uh, I think sometimes people look at, especially people who meet me in the last like year and a half when my wife's lived here and stuff like that, mm-hmm. people just think, ah, he's married and he's got a cool show. He's, he's funny, whatever. But like 2013 Patrick here in New York, I was like, uh, I was walking dogs and, uh, doing everything I could like going to parks and handing out flyers for dog walking, comp- not even 
flyering comedy shows. I was flyering dog walking. Flyering dog To make walking, enough yeah. money so that I could pay my rent that was already a week late. Mm -hmm. uh, like crying every night on the J train because I was living in East New York. But when I got the apartment, they told me it was Bushwick and, you know, right. shit like that. So um, really bad neighborhood. Yeah, just bad. Everything was bad. Um, uh, yeah, which is cool because that makes the story better when it's like I'm prevailing, you know. Now no, I'm yeah, in a nice you, neighborhood. Yeah, uh, and, and you are. And I think you're doing you're doing great. You're yeah. the, I I would say if if someone asked me like if if someone asked me like about how to go about being a comedian in in New York, I would probably cite you. Oh yeah. As as an example. Because you're doing all, start two years in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because you're doing the things, you're doing the things that are going to actually help you, and and the kind of the people who are going to help you in comedy are not necessarily going to be the bookers. Yeah. At at first, it's going to be the other comics. Yeah. Or, and and I'm not like I I guess I'm not going to ever. Um, I think starting at 26, one thing that really helped me was that I was a grown up already. Uh, I I had fucked up in college. I had made lots of mistakes in my life. I was in lots of debt. Uh, I had come out on the other end. I was married. I was in love. I traveled over a little bit. So like, I just remember like I I was super ang I had super anxiety and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But like one time there was somebody who was putting me on a uh, I got an e I got a message from a comic who was like, G oh I've heard great things about you. You should come do my show at this club. And I was like I'd been here like a year. And I was like that sounds awesome. This is so exciting. And then so I said yes. And then like a week later they messaged me and was like okay well it's a bringer and you have to bring five people. And it's this much money, and the, or you know, this much a piece, and they have to buy drinks. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm not gonna do that then. And they went off on me, and they mm -hmm. like went like in Facebook Messenger, like boom, boom, blush, message after message about how they were gonna ruin me, and how they were gonna ruin my comedy, and I was never gonna get booked anywhere. And I was like, I was like, at the time, like 29. I was like, no, who do you think you are? Like, no, no, this, I'm not gonna stand for this. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just one of those things that like I know that if I was like. If I was 22 years old and I got those messages, I probably would have lost my mind. Right. Uh, but luckily, I was kind of a grown-up already. And I was just like, well, no, I know that you're not going to ruin me or anything like that. And I've seen that person a bunch since then, and they've never once brought it up. Uh -huh. uh, they have no idea who I am. And it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, ugh, it's just it's just that uh, that mentality where I'm not going to be, I'm not going to let somebody, I'm, I'm not going to let somebody take advantage of me, but I'm also not going to be rude to anybody. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. like, uh, um, if anybody asks me to do something, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it the best I can, you know? Oh yeah, ab yeah, absolutely. And that's probably like being good to work with. I, th it, everyone talks about is like a big part of the, the thing. Cause there's, why would you, cause there's funny people everywhere. Yeah. So might as well be, yeah. I, I think it could only help you to be funny and not a dick. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, uh, the thing is, is like, it doesn't t like, you can, like I said this a little earlier, like you can be not the funniest on stage or not the mm -hmm. funniest yet, you know? Yeah. But if you're a nice person, nice, nice comic, nice, like a nice guy or a nice girl, people are going to like you. But mm -hmm. like if you're, you could be the funniest person in the room. If you're a total asshole, it doesn't matter. There are comedians in this city that like, I will, I will like run downstairs to watch their set at the Creek or I'll run upstairs to watch their set at the Creek, mm -hmm. but I will not have a conversation with them. Like I, like if I'm standing outside, I'll walk <laughs> away and these people don't know it. There's people that like, I'm like, you have to be so funny to have people put up with how insufferable you are. Um, and that's the thing that I, I've never, and some people cite it as like my Midwestern charm or whatever, mm -hmm. but it's just like, don't be an asshole. There's, right. no, there's nothing to gain from it. Yeah. I have a lot of that too. Cause I'm from what people consider, some people consider to be the South yeah. being from Maryland. But yeah, I kind of have a little bit of that sort of like, like slower pace of life sort of yeah. of the mind. Like, the, just, like ugh. I'm just, you know, I'm go I'm, in in my mind sometimes i'm just in my dad's truck we're driving down a dirt road and yeah. we're just looking at and we're just looking for deer yeah. you know i still try to hold on to a little a little bit of that and then i i also try to hold on to i i try to hold on to the like it's you know life's you know you don't deserve to you don't have to like put up with shitty treatment yeah yeah to, you shouldn't yeah and there's so much of that in this business where people get locked into stuff and they're mm -hmm. like, uh, I'll, like, I'll have friends. I'm like, why are you doing that show? And they're like, oh, I got to and this and this and this. And, and I feel like I'm obligated. And I'm like, well, that's 
I don't ever want to be. That's why, and like, it probably hurts me. Like, there, it hurts me in a lot of ways. I can, mm -hmm. I know that's hurt me, um, because uh, there's certain things that like I don't want to do to get on stage. I don't like bringers. Uh, if it's a friend of mine and I like them and I support the room that they're doing and I can bring somebody and I have the ability, I'll do it. But like, I'm probably not going to do your bringer. And it's not me mm -hmm. thinking I'm better than anybody else, but I come from the school of thought of packing the room should be on the show or should be on the producer. Um, and so no, yeah. it I makes no sense for me to bring people. And, and everybody, another thing is like, everybody is like, we need a tape. Everybody needs a tape in this business. Got to get a good video. Yeah. And so that's what these people doing these bringers and stuff are, force on are people. doing it. Yeah. They're like, well, you bring all these people, you'll get a good tape. But you can also fuck that. You can do what you guys did at the uh, at um, Halyards. Mm -hmm. You can do a show where it's like everybody's just gonna do sets, and then we're all gonna get a good video, and we're all gonna support each other. You invite all your friends, and it's not forcing it, but you get a good tape out of that. Like you don't have to do things. Uh, right. The same way everyone else has always always done it, just because they've always done it. Yeah, and doing it that way, you're also you're, you're it's a little bit more of a because you're doing it for yourself. Yeah. So you have a lot more invested in it. So I think you're a lot you're a lot willing to work a lot harder yeah. on it uh, compared to c compared compared to like bringers at yeah. at clubs that you know may or may not give a shit. Yeah, and I'm not saying, uh, there's other, I have comics that are friends that do bringers often, mm -hmm. and they're great, and they get way different stage time than I do, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I just think like, if you're gonna do it, make sure you, make sure you're getting more than what you're giving. Cause like, if you bring five people and they pay 20 bucks a piece, and then they're also all buying two drinks, you're making that club, or maybe not even the club, don't look at it as the club, cause the clubs are oblivious, the clubs are, doing us a huge favor by even being a thing. Like, yeah. you know, even the, the worst- The fact that a club even yeah, exists. Even the worst club, I will always commend them. But but the producer of that show, the person who's telling you to do this, you're making for the club, through them, like 500 bucks. So make sure mm -hmm. whatever you're getting out of that is worth your time. Because you could, if it's just a mere stage time, if you're just doing like an eight minute set or something, you could do an eight minute set anywhere else for free and probably get more out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't know. I've never, maybe it's just because I've never done a good, you know, I used to hate competitions. I always said competitions were bullshit. That's because I kept losing competitions. Then I won a competition <laughs> and I was like, they're pretty good. Yeah, like, they're, they're pretty fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I have the same feelings yeah. regarding on if I win or lose. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's like, it's like, um, yeah, like oh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> is that what the show is supposed to be? <laughs> that, no, dude, 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 this is, this is good. I feel like, a, I feel like I know you. Yeah, that's great. I feel like I know you. So, okay. So before before we get out here, so we're gonna we're still gonna do that. Uh, everyone gets in the room and and re we record a music album. Oh, uh, yeah. I, this is a very new idea. Um, I like I was saying. I said this earlier. Uh, I like doing a thousand different things. Mm -hmm. um, basically, something I have is uh, I have a bunch of songs that I've written over the years. Uh, some of them are folk. Some of them are like punky. Some of them are poppy. Uh, and I have all these songs, but I can't sing. And I'm not that good of a guitar player. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. that good of a musician. And so I think it would be fun to get a handful of comics who have music backgrounds together, uh, all get in a room, have, like, a meeting beforehand where we all discuss what we do. Because, like, maybe my song's not the best song. Maybe somebody else has a really cool song that they wrote. Mm -hmm. um, but have it be the same five or six people. Basically make a band for a day and then get together and spend an hour on each song, do, like, eight hours where it's, like, a full day's work uh, in a basement somewhere. We practice, 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 write the song, write the song, write the song. And at the end of the hour, we record the song, however it is, and then that's the track. And then at the end of it, we just have a, like an eight track album. Uh, and I think it'd be a super interesting thing to do um, just as a way to get all, because like, it's kind of like, uh, like, I guess if you're a com, the way I feel about it with comedy is it's like writing a joke. Uh, if I write a joke that I think is super funny and I really mm -hmm. like it, but then never telling it on stage seems insane to me. Yeah. But I have songs that I love that I think are really good that I have no one's ever heard them. And that I get that same feeling. It's like in the pit of my stomach. I'm like, this needs to be out there. Unfortunately, with a joke, all I need is my voice and my brain. And with a, a song. And, and a show. Or yeah. A, or a with a song, I need so much more stuff. I need, I need, I need bands and I need, uh, I need friends. And, and I did this show that Shelby Taylor put together a, a couple months back 
where uh, uh, Alex Fleming and I put together a band. We played a live band for the show. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time I'd played guitar in front of people in almost 10 years. And, or more than 10 years. And it was, it was amazing. It was so fun. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I'm kind of like, I want to, that's something I want to do. And I know because you, you play bass. Uh, yeah, I play uh, bass and I play guitar. And yeah. I also have uh, me, Benel, and uh, my old roommate, Corey Nachman, wrote some what I think are the best songs we've I've been a part of. Yeah. And then he, he moved back to New Hampshire Ugh. and then I, it's kind of hard for me and Benel to find, yeah. find time. So I just really want the songs recorded and, and same out there. Th- yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, my friend, I have a friend that did the same thing. My friend Luke Ritter, who I started comedy with and he's literally one of the funniest guys. Uh, I think he's one of the best comics I ever saw. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he moved to New York after a couple months here. He realized he didn't really like doing comedy anymore. Um, which is fine. He, he lost the passion for it. Yeah. Um, and then after about a month more, he decided he didn't want to live in New York anymore. So he moved back to Iowa. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was really sad. I was like, I lost that. I just lose one of my best friends is what's he going to do now. And then a couple months later, he just sent me a message. I was like, Hey, I've got this album and I run a record label with my friends. And so he's like, do you want to do this out? And he's got this amazing album of music that he did. And it's like, and it's born out of his time in New York and what it was like being here and his problems with it and what he uh-huh. didn't like about it. Um, and so uh, I would suggest everybody go listen to that. Go to uh, uh, Beast yeah, of Village we... Records and listen to Luke Ritter. And it, and that's a huge, it's funny because it's like, it's a huge influence on me wanting to do this because it's like, oh, he did the thing I wanted to do. He got all those songs out. Uh, and, and I okay. got to help just by releasing it. But it's like, uh, and now he's working on the second album already. And it's like, Ugh, it's, that's great ugh. what what's it called again it's called his name is luke ritter the album is called uh full bloom or no excuse me the album's called late bloom and it's uh on beast village records you can just mm-hmm. go to beast village records stop and you can get it on there cool. um and it's just singer songwriter acoustic rock but it's so good and he's the same way that he was he was great at telling jokes because he has an interesting way of telling stories mm-hmm. same thing with songs i mean he's got these great songs um, and so awesome. I would suggest everybody, yeah. And that was a huge inspiration on me. I'm like, well, if I can, if Luke's doing it, yeah, I can't not, you know what I mean? I, I, there's no reason not to do it. Um, and I'll, so that's what this project is. Yeah. Great. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to give that a listen because, and yeah, I really want to, I really hope we do this cause I want to yeah, get yeah. these. Me too. It's, uh, I really want to get this, this stuff out. That's something that, uh, 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 I feel like I'm, I, I feel like I'm doing too many things right now, mm-hmm. but I don't think I'm doing anything half ass, which I'm proud of. Uh, but That's good. It's because of that whole I'm trying to fill out time. I'm trying to make, and also I really like doing it. Like I like running shows. I like uh, doing stand up constantly. I like the podcast that I'm doing. I like all that stuff. Um, and so if doing this band stuff and also making it so it's like one day, it's literally eight hours out of a day. Mm-hmm. So if it sucks and we all hate each other, it's over. It's not like we have to tour and do shows. But if it's super awesome and rad and we can do a show at a, like Freddy's bar or something some night, that'd be fun. That could be a cool thing too, but that's not what that's not the point of it. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like it's like when I got into when I first did my first couple open mics, the goal wasn't to move to New York and try to get successful. It was just to do a couple open mics. Right. Um, and that's what this this music project is, is like I want to try to do this. See what we can have. Maybe people have chemistry, maybe don't. Maybe 2 hours in somebody's like I don't like doing this. And that's totally fine because, you know, you can leave and maybe somebody else wants to do, wants to play drums on this or something. Um, and I like, I like the idea of being like a, a, a temp, a starting a temporary music project. The only thing is, is that I'm super controlling. And like, if like, I want it, I want to have the, uh, uh, not, I'm not controlling in a negative way, but I like to, I don't you like have what, a specific way you want. I know it to what be. I want to do. Yeah. And so like, um, uh, and in music, a lot of times it's a bunch of uh, those oh, too many cowboys. What is it? <laughs> too many cowboys, not enough Indians. That's probably not it. Uh, but it's something like that. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think I know what you're saying. Yeah. Well, if if everyone's uh, the the president, it's hard for a democracy to. Yeah, yeah, run. yeah, totally. Um, no, yeah, I'm hip to that. I'm I'm hip to that. Well, gosh, man, I hope we. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to that. And if you yeah. ever just want to come back over and we'll play guitar. Oh yeah, I haven't jammed forever. Uh, I did that little thing with Alex, and that was super fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't have anything anymore. I, my acoustic is uh, busted. Uh, I don't have an amp. I've got a my GX70 electric here. Uh, okay. All right. So I have I have my acoustic. I have my electric, and then I have two bases one is a pretty sweet bass that chelsea just oh i just saw that yeah i saw that on facebook that's awesome um so i 
all, all the only thing I don't have is percussion. Yeah. So I have a, I have somebody that I've talked to because uh, I put out the first feeler on Facebook for this thing, mm-hmm. and I have a friend that I talked to about p- potentially doing it with his studio and well not studio but at his place. Yeah. And uh, he has musical stuff too, and so um, that's kind of where I'm starting. But it, but it's one of those things too that like um, I'm. I since I'm doing a lot of stuff, I schedule things really shitty. So this mm-hmm. is one of those things that in my head I'm like, uh, in my head I'm always like, let's do this July 12th, like a weekend in July. Uh-huh. But to everybody else, that's like a million miles away. You know what I mean? Like, no, the, um, I'm trying. No, I plan that's a stuff good way. really far ahead. That's a really good way to think because you know, it, that way you can like plan for it, and and especially for my schedule because I got season tickets. Oh for, yeah, totally. Know, so. And that's why oh. that's why it was so hard for me and you to hook up for this podcast because like I. I, podcasts and things like that, like shows and getting on stuff last minute is kind of hard because I have stuff booked ahead. Of, not And not that I'm doing a lot of stuff, but even if it's not shows, there's nights of the week where I don't do anything because I want to go hang out with my wife or like yeah. where we're supposed to go do laundry. Like I have, we have to do married couple. We have to take our dog to the vet on Saturday. So I can't do, or no next week. So I can't do anything next week. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of one of those things that like when something pops up last second, it's like no matter how much, how cool it is, Sometimes I can't make it. <laughs> I'm like, Ugh, this sucks. <laughs> right. Uh, or I don't want to do something that I don't have time for, you know, and then sure. panic. Ugh. Well, I'm glad we finally got time to, yeah, this sit, was super and ch- fun. to sit and chat for a bit, man. Because uh, you're, you're, I, I think you're really funny, and I, and I like you as a person. Yeah. I, like when we, I like when we chat. I like you, too. I also think it'll be super fun for the listeners to listen to this because I was asleep on the train when I got here and then I drank a cup of coffee during the show uh-huh. and now I am wired as hell. So I think you'll hear that. You'll hear the progression of me <laughs> ramping up. Uh, right now I think I'm just going to go run. I'm going to run to Manhattan right now. I don't think I'm going to take the train back. <laughs> oh man. I appreciate you doing Thanks. this, Pat. Uh, can I plug something real quick? Oh, is that, dude. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah, okay. yeah, of, of um, course. Uh, I just did, I just put out an AP uh, of my comedy uh, I put it out. It's on that same label, Beast Village Records. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called. Uh, it's it's a awesome. It's a, a a cool rap metal EP. Uh, it's not rap metal. It's comedy. But it's a it's seven minutes. It's comedy that I'm really proud of. It's a set I'm really proud of. It's jokes I'm really proud of. Uh, uh, and you can get it for free. Just go to that. Go to Beast Village Records or Beast Village Records Bandcamp.com or Beast Village Bandcamp.com yeah. and uh, download it for free. Listen to it. Tell your friends. Share it. All that. Yes, and I'll plug it in the description awesome. as well yeah, so yeah, if yeah. you're on your smartphone yeah you can just copy and paste that yeah. or patrickhasty.com you can get everything on there yeah. too yeah but that's yeah that's what i'm it's funny because i never have anything that i'm super like even i put out an ep a couple of years ago i don't tell anybody about it because i'm not that proud of it yeah uh but this thing i'm super jazzed about awesome so, man yeah yeah because i want to get some, i'm i'm like building up to when i can put some something out yeah and but this is what i'm doing until yeah, 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 i can yeah. do that so I appreciate you being a part of it. No, band. this was awesome. I love that. See, the, the punk rock thing. Like, when you're in a band, you write two songs, and then you put them out, and then you get better, and those songs get better. But in comedy, we're all like, no, we got to wait 15 years. And I'm 100% on with that, with a full-length album. Yeah. But with, like, I got these three jokes, and somebody recorded it really well, and this crowd likes it, and I'm proud of it. Fuck it. It's stupid to not put it out for free. Yeah. You know? I'm not making people pay for my dumb voice. Right. Nothing to nothing to lose if it's if it's good and yeah. it's free. That's yeah. what I say. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> do whatever, do whatever you want. Yeah, that that's the one. If you take one thing away from me and Pat's uh, conversation, it's do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need anyone's permission. No, and also comedy advice. Uh, number one, do what you want. Number two, marry a landscape architect. Landscape uh, architect. It makes life so easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Will. Thanks, Pat. listening as always everybody you can uh, check out my website willcarryisfunny.com if you want to see links to any of my future stand updates that's c-a-r-e-y is funny.com you can also follow me on twitter at comic will carry and you can check out uh, patrick hasty's comedy ep a cool rap metal ep on beast village records i will have a link for it in the description and i will also uh post this on my instagram which um 
if you if you're on Instagram, I personally think I have a, a pretty fun feed. So uh, Will Carry Two Three on Instagram if you're interested. Um, I appreciate you guys being here, and I will see you next week between awesome and disaster. Bye.